I'm Art Wong, uh, in case you don't know, from HR. And I just wanted to say part of the reason we're, we're interested in doing these kinds of talks is because we see UC as a good pipeline for our future employees. So <laughs> hopefully your kids are going to go to UC, they're going to graduate, and they're going to come back and work for the lab. Right? Um, and just so you know, um, there's about 3,800 employees at the laboratory who have a, some type of a college degree. And of those 3,800, 21% have a degree from a UC campus. Wow. So we have 21% of our degreed individuals at the lab uh, came from one of the UC campuses. So um, if you couldn't tell, I came from Cal. Um, and uh, looking forward to that UCLA game, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, if, by the way, if any of you have a defensive back in the family, we could use them at, at Cal. So. Um, our speaker today is Avira Spears. Uh, Avira um, works for uh, UCOP, uh, the Office of the President. Um, she works there supervising the admissions officers uh, from all the uh, UC campuses. Uh, but prior to that, she was actually uh, one of the admissions officers at Cal. And uh, what's kind of interesting in her bio is that in that time, she said she read something like over 20,000 different um, uh, essays you know, from p uh, potential students. Um, that's a lot of. That's a lot of essays, and um, so I'm sure she has some, some tips or uh, interesting uh, information that she can give you about what, what's been in those essays. Um, <laughs> so uh, without, without reading you know, her full bio, I think it's more important that you, you hear from her. Uh, so we're very happy to have you here today. And, um, just, and just by the way, we're being, we're being uh, videotaped. Um, I only say that in case you have a, a question you want to ask and you might want to consider how you speak. Phrase that question. <laughs> it won't you. reflect on your child, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Art. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking time to come in and listen to me. Um, I have been out here, I think, three of the last four years. And every year when I get the invitation, I think, oh, no, I can't possibly take on another commitment. And then I say, yeah, I'm going to come. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, the presentation that I have for today, we're going to make it available to you, the PowerPoint. And um, while there is um, a certain amount of basic information, I want to be sure to share with everyone because some of you may have a student who is just starting ninth grade. Some of you may have seniors who will be applying to UC in November. Um, and some of you just may be interested in knowing about UC admissions and you don't have any little ones running about at all. So it's going to be kind of difficult to do a really thorough presentation covering all of those different aspects. So I'll try to do that as much as I can. I think what is most important is that everything I'm going to tell you today is on our website. You might have to search for it, but it's out there. Um, so I really want to spend more time taking your individual questions. And as Art said, because we're being recorded, you might want to just carefully think about how you want to word your question. And when I reply, even though it's to a specific situation, I will try to make it a broad response so it's applicable to everyone. OK? So to get started, why should your student be interested in coming to the University of California? Well, among other reasons, like coming here to work at the lab, um, you know, UC offers over 700 majors across our nine undergraduate campuses. We have professors who are leaders on, in their field, a couple of whom have recently been awarded Nobel Prizes. There's lots of research opportunities, including available to undergraduate students. A lot of folks have a misunderstanding that a freshman or a sophomore would never have an opportunity to work with faculty doing research, but those opportunities actually do exist through organized programs at each of the campuses. Internships are a great way for students to get some work experience and perhaps to start networking so that when they graduate and they actually are applying for permanent career positions, they can explain that they've had that experience already and they can reach out to those colleagues that they've met along the way and looking for other opportunities. Many students love to travel abroad and why not study and earn some credit towards your UC degree while you're out there also exploring some new culture or countryside. And of course, all of our campuses provide resources to make sure that our students are successful in starting and finishing at UC. 
In case you don't know, um, as I mentioned, we have nine undergraduate campuses. The 10th campus in San Francisco is a professional campus for graduate programs in the health sciences. So for our purposes, when we talk about the undergraduate admissions process, we only refer to our nine campuses that offer undergraduate degree programs. Locations, as you know, are up and down the state of California. We think that it is really important for students to find the right fit for them. And the right fit is not only the academic programs that are offered, but it might be the climate. It might be how far away they are from home. So we think that there's lots of choice amongst the UC campuses, and we hope students will take the time to find the right fit for themselves. So let's get into the admissions process. It's a two-step process. First, there is meeting the requirements, and then it's going through the selection process. Many, many, many well-qualified students meet and exceed the admissions requirements. Where it becomes more tricky and creates a level of anxiety, if you will, for students and their families is the selection component. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what students can do to better present themselves for the selection process and also how we go about selecting the students. I'm also going to um, talk about transfer admission very briefly just in case anyone or their student is interested in that as a path to a UC bachelor's degree. So for freshman admissions, we always talk about what the minimum requirements are. Again, in a competitive environment where there are many more applicants who are well qualified than there are spaces available, of course, students who exceed minimums will generally have a better opportunity of being selected for admission. So this pattern of coursework is referred to as the A to G pattern throughout the state of California. And for every high school in California, public or private, that wishes to have UC review their course offerings, we will advise them which one of their courses will meet each of these subject categories. Again, we're showing the minimum number of years in each of the areas. But for the vast majority of students who are on a college track, they're going to exceed these without even having to think about whether or not they have the appropriate coursework. The minimum grade point average required within this specific pattern of coursework or any courses that meet these subject requirements is a 3.0 that's a weighted on a 5.0 scale. And we will include all coursework in grades that the student has completed from summer after ninth grade through summer after 11th grade in our GPA calculation to come to at least the minimum to meet the requirements. UC also requires either the ACT uh, plus writing or the SAT. And I'll talk about the new enhanced ACT and the new SAT in just a moment. There it is. So the ACT has enhancing their um, examination for admissions. And basically what they're doing is they're going to add more subscores and they're going to add a little bit more in terms of the writing component. And for the SAT, they are going back. If some of you are my age, um, there was the SAT verbal math. Then they went to the SAT, which is critical reading, writing, and math. Now we're going back to critical reading and math. But UC will still require what is now going to be the optional writing component. Our faculty really believe that seeing students' skill in writing is absolutely essential to determining how well they're going to do as a student at UC, regardless of the major that they're going to go into. So we will accept the new examinations. And if students take both, because the new exams will be offered beginning in the spring of 2016, if the student takes the current or the new, we'll accept either score and we will use the one to the student's advantage. Again, continuing with the freshman admissions requirements, as I briefly mentioned before, we do have approved course lists for every high school in the state that wishes to have UC review the courses. We have a website so that if you have a student starting with ninth grade, you can go to the website and every year the course lists are updated based on submissions by the school and you will be able to see exactly which course the school offers meets each of those area A through G subject requirements. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, for the examinations, we use the highest total from one administration date. So for example, with the um, SAT, if a student takes it more than one time, and by the way, one, we have no preference of ACT over SAT, either is fine, or if the student takes both, we'll use the highest. Um, also, we don't penalize students at all for taking those examinations multiple times. Um, we're just looking for the highest total score from one single test date. So what we do not do is mix and match. So we wouldn't take the critical reading score from an exam date in November and combine that with the math score from an exam date in December. It's the highest total from the same examination date. Also, in case you're not aware, in the past, UC did require SAT subject test of all applicants. We eliminated that requirement um, beginning with fall 2012 freshman admits. SAT subject tests are not required, but they may be recommended depending upon the individual UC campus and the program for which the student is applying. In most cases, if students are going into STEM areas, particularly engineering, faculty like to see the subject test in science or math. And actually, three UC campuses do not require the subject test for any major. And if the student submits it, they will not look at them at all. We have, um, as you can see throughout the presentation, I have individual websites that you can go to for detailed information on each of these topics that I am covering very briefly. OK. It's also important to know that the University of California is still adhering to the master plan for higher education in the state of California. And the master plan calls for UC to admit the top 12.5% of high school graduates, California residents throughout the state, and guarantee them a spot at UC. In order to get to that 12.5%, what UC has done is we've set up two pools of applicants who will get the guarantee if they meet the right criteria. So for the top 9% in statewide context, that means relative to all graduates in the state of California, if the student meets the minimum subject requirement, the GPA requirement, takes the required examinations, and has the necessary, what we refer to as the UC score, they're going to be guaranteed admission. On the website that I've indicated, the student can go in and select their GPA, select their test scores, and oh, by the way, they have to have already taken either the ACT plus writing or the SAT in order to identify the UC score, but they can use the score calculator and it will tell them if they have the right UC score to be afforded this guarantee. We also will guarantee admissions to students who are in the top 9% of their high school's graduating class. So one is statewide and one is specific to the high school environment that the student is in. In order to meet the uh, criteria for their local context, top 9%, students must have at least a 3.0 in a specific pattern or a subset of the A to G course requirements. Of course, they still have to take the standardized examination and then they have to meet a benchmark GPA that is specific to their school. So how will students know that they will meet the local context? As I said, for students that are in the top 9% statewide, we have a calculator on our website that will answer that question. However, for students in the local context, the way we identify them and calculate that is once they've actually submitted their application to UC. So when they click Submit, then they can immediately log back in, and it will say either, yes, you meet the criteria for the top 9% local context, or no, you do not. All right, what does the admission guarantee mean? It means that if the student's a California resident, and they either meet the criteria for top 9% statewide or top 9% in the local context, UC promises them a space at a campus if the campuses to which they apply did not offer them admission. So in other words, if the student applies to only Berkeley and LA and is not offered admission, then they will be offered admission to another UC campus that has space. <coughs> but if a student applies to 
Santa Cruz, Riverside, and San Diego, and they get admission to Riverside, but they really, really, really hope to die, really wanted San Diego, they don't get the guarantee because they've already received an offer of admission. Does that make sense? I see a couple parents cracking up at my <laughs> examples, but it's a realistic example, okay? So they will get one. Now, just to be perfectly transparent right now, the one UC campus that will have space available, but they're also dwindling in terms of space, and I'll speak to that in just a moment, is UC Merced. So the Merced campus, as some of you may know, is our newest campus. It was opened in 2005, and they um, have not had a lot of funding. Funding was cut for the growth of the campus, so they're starting to run out of space a little bit sooner than we anticipated because we expected that we would be able to build more classroom space, more dormitory space or residence hall space, and that hasn't happened because of the major recession we went through and a cut in funding from the state. So Merced is a little concerned that in a few more years they will no longer be able to uh, be a campus that can offer that guarantee. We are currently working with the chancellors at all of the UC campuses to look at their enrollment plans for the next five to ten years to ensure that every campus will take as many California residents as the state funds us to take and maybe a few more beyond that um, so that Merced won't have to run out of space to be able to take the guarantee pool. All right, once the student has met those requirements and they have applied then all of our campuses use a process called comprehensive review to look at each application. Every single application is looked at individually. We are looking at the context of the student's personal, educational, community experience to determine how well they have achieved. Let me give you an example. So if a student is fortunate and they attend one of the top private schools in the Bay Area, like my daughter did. I was talking to one of your colleagues here, and her daughter attends Head Royce. My daughter graduated from the Head Royce School in 2009. And so there are different opportunities available at her school than are available at other schools. So the question is, did she take advantage of the opportunities that were available? And if she did, that is fantastic. If she did not, that's the context, right? It's what resources and the opportunities are available based on family circumstances, based on community circumstances, based on the school that the student attends, did they take advantage of those opportunities? And if they did, we'll see that throughout their application. And we will be looking at those students and comparing them against other students from the same school who had the same opportunities. But if a student went to a school that, for example, didn't offer honors classes, or there was only one section of AP English, and there were only 30 seats, and this student was number 35 on the list, the student attempted to take advantage but could not. We would expect that student to explain that to us in their application. And I'm going to give you some more tips about how students can best present themselves in their application in a few minutes. Of the process in reviewing them, there are 14 factors, academic and non-academic, that our faculty have set out. I've indicated the website where you can go and see the list of the factors. Among the factors are the rigor of their academic program. Let me give you a realistic example. A student who takes the basic courses, Algebra, English 10, Biology 1, and gets straight A's, is not going to be viewed in the same way as the student who takes advanced uh, algebra trig, honors English 11, AP bio. You see what I'm saying? What we're expecting students to do is really take the most rigorous program that is available to them. And before you ask the question, if they're taking the most rigorous, do you want them to get an A or do you want them to get a B? And the answer is, we want them to get an A. All right. What is also really important to know, because this is a myth that is floating out there, is that the decision of one campus 
is not influenced by the decision of another. If you're familiar with the UC admissions application, you know there is one application for our system. And a student can choose to apply to as many of our nine campuses as they wish. They can pick a different major at every single campus if they wish. That doesn't matter. But when the application is being reviewed by the staff at UC Santa Cruz, that's all Santa Cruz cares about is that student applied to their campus. And it doesn't matter what other campus they applied to or if they applied for a different major. Campuses do not call each other and say, Ivera, I read this app and I think I'm going to say yes. Are you going to say yes too? Because if you're going to say yes, then I'm going to say no. Then well, No, that's not how it works. Every single application is reviewed independently by each campus. Okay, now. Comprehensive review is the overarching process. There are different methods of comprehensive review that campuses employ. Seven of our, I'm sorry, six of our nine campuses now employ the holistic method of comp review. What that means is that there is no fixed weight assigned to any one criteria. It's just you read the entire thing you look at the context, you consider all the factors, and you arrive at a decision in a holistic manner. Some of our campuses use a part formulaic, part holistic method, where they may calculate the GPA, multiply it by a factor, add in the test scores, and that's part of it. And then the rest of it, they review more holistically the non-quantifiable factors, for example. Other campuses look at, I'm sorry, did I, oh. other campuses use a fixed weight model where there's X amount of value added based on some criteria. So maybe 50% of their decision is going to be on the basis of the GPA alone. But what's important to note is it doesn't matter how the campus is employing comprehensive review. Students should prepare and complete the application in exactly the same way. Details for how campuses review applications is available on each of the campuses' admissions website. Okay, what I said before was that here are the minimum requirements. More students exceed the minimum. So now they've applied. We talk about how we review them, but then how do we choose which one of them to offer admission to? That's going to depend on a variety of factors, many of which the admission staff have no control over. For example, first the first, it depends on the strength and size of the applicant pool. Let me give you an example. UCLA for fall of 2014 had somewhere in the area of 85,000 freshman applicants apply. So if you have many more applicants than you have space available, the size and strength of your pool is going to affect your admission rate. So UCLA for fall of 14, I'm trying to recall the number explicitly, but it's in the presentation, I think their admit rate was like 17%. So if the number of applications either go down and the spaces go up, then the admit rate would change. Or if the application numbers go up higher, and the spaces go down lower, that admit rate is going to also be lower. So what is important to note is that UC campuses are not trying to go out to the public and say, oh, we're so exclusive, we really don't admit a lot of people. That is not our point, our purpose. You know, to tout that you have an admit rate of only 10%, my opinion, is not a good thing. What we're saying is, depending upon the size and strength of the pool, we take as many well-qualified California residents as we receive state funding to enroll. Other factors that could affect the admission rate depends on yield. That means that for each campus, they are offering more spaces than they actually have available. So when Berkeley offers admission to 12,000 students for the fall term, they're actually only expecting about 4,200 of them to show up. Historically, across the campuses, they can look at what their yield has been. I know Berkeley more well, so I'm going there. Berkeley's yield rate is usually in the area of 40 to 42%. It doesn't wiggle much from year to year. 
So they know that they're going to have to make more offers in order to get 40 to 42 percent to say yes to them. Why? Because students have lots of other choices. Personally, I think it is very powerful for a student to be able to say, no, thank you. I choose to go to this other institution. So I think your students should just continue to prepare themselves for university study, apply where they actually can see themselves fitting in. But if they get an offer and it's not the best fit for them, it's perfectly OK to say, no, thank you. Other factors, graduation rates. If more students graduate, that opens up space. When the economy is not so great, sometimes we see students saying, well, instead of taking 15 units, I'm going to take 13 units. And then they're going to have to stay an extra term because if they do that for several terms, now they're going to have a whole extra term that they need to stay. Or if students are really changing their mind about their major and starting out, I knew a young man, this is a true story, who started out in engineering. And then once he got to the junior level, he changed to philosophy. Very different preparation needed for those majors, so he had to extend his time of enrollment because he changed his mind. We're not saying that students can't change their mind. They're welcome to do so. As a parent, you might not like that if you're paying for it, but those factors will also influence what the admit rate is like. Also, campuses, the chancellor, helps the campus to set what their enrollment goals are going to be. If a campus has funding to build additional classroom spaces, additional residence hall, they may increase their enrollment size, which means they can increase the number of new students they admit. But if they are taking housing offline because it needs to be retrofitted for earthquake safety, then they're going to have fewer bed spaces, and they might reduce their enrollment for a period of time until that facility is back online. A lot of these factors no one has control over. So don't always gravitate to what the admit rate is, my opinion. Focus on is it the right fit and does the student have a reasonable chance of being offered admission. All right, so how can your students better present themselves on the application? It's not just about the personal statement, although our application readers learn a great deal about students there. One of the first uh, suggestions we tell students is, a question is, tell us about the world you come from, right? And so students will start to talk about influences. And they may say, oh, my dad's an engineer, so I'm interested in being an engineer. Good enough. Then my dad did this, and my dad did that, and my dad did this. and my and I'm like, and where am I reading about the student? Because the dad already has his degree, so I don't need to admit him. The point is, we want students to talk about themselves. For some students, that's not an easy task. For some students, it's a cultural thing that you don't brag on yourself. But in our personal statement, that's exactly what we need you to do. Because otherwise, we can't learn about the individual student unless they use a lot of I statements. I chose to do this. This is why I made that choice. And as a result of my choice, I learned this. And because I had the experience and learned that, I applied that to other aspects of my life. Those are the kind of things we're going to be looking for in the personal statement. Other things that we ask students to do is to talk about um, participation in either school activities or organizations volunteer work, or paid employment. What we're looking for is where the student is showing interest, where they're showing a commitment and dedication over time. So the student who joins Club A for grade 9 and then drops that one, and then gets a different club for grade 10 and then drops that one. Or my better example is you see no participation 9, 10, 11, and all of a sudden in the senior year, I'm the founder of the chess club. Well, we don't want students to try to game us with what they put on their application. We're really looking for students who are active and they're a part of their high school community. They're a part of their neighborhood community. They're a part of their city community because they do volunteer work. It's what they choose to do, why they choose to do it, 
what they learned as a result of the choice, how they applied it, and that they did it over a period of time. So one and out doesn't work so well, unless there's a very good explanation that goes with a one and out. Uh, here's an example. My daughter played piano, and she liked to play for her grandmother. And she decided that she would volunteer at a retirement community to play the liven up the community room. Well, she did that for a few months, and then she decided she didn't want to do it. And so, of course, I'm going like, well, why not? This is a good thing to do. It looks good on your application. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that at all. You know, it's a good thing to do. These elderly people enjoy having a young person, that energy that comes in. It gives them somebody new to talk to. And she said, Mom, to be honest with you, the smell, all the disinfectants, all the germs, I just don't think it's a healthy environment for you. That's legitimate. That was her concern. I'm not going to say, no, I'm going to send you out there anyway. So students may choose not to do something consistently. A brief explanation helps us to understand what the context, OK? We have a really good PowerPoint that has detailed notes on every slide. Unlike most PowerPoint presentations where you only get the slide itself, for this presentation, make sure you and your students read all of the notes that we've included, a lot of individual tips on how to complete the application and better present the student. All right, so sometimes there's an elephant in the room, and I'm not sure that I see it today, but I decided to get ahead of the elephant just in case it decides to walk into the room. People are talking about UC admitting non-residents. So let's talk about what we do what, and what we don't do, OK? First and foremost, non-residents are not displacing California residents. What do we mean by that? We mean that the state of California provides funding to the University of California to enroll a specific number of California resident freshmen every fall term. We are absolutely meeting that number, and for some of our campuses, they are individually exceeding that number because the campus can choose to admit students for which they are not funded. The other issue is that, is there additional capacity on the campuses to admit more California residents above the funded level? The answer is yes. But the faculty and the chancellors are choosing not to go up to that full amount for California residents only because they're not going to be funded for that student. There's a formula. It's called cost of attending. And when you do the formula for what it costs for a student to go through the UC and earn their bachelor's degree, and you add up what it would cost in tuition to go through, those numbers don't add up. So the cost of a, for a student to attend is not fully covered by tuition. So for students that the campus enroll above the level for which the state funds them, they have to find another way to cover those costs. What they're doing currently is they're admitting non-residents. Some campuses are admitting significantly more than others. It's a choice that their chancellor is making. And actually, UC President Janet Napolitano is expecting to go to the Board of Regents at their November meeting to discuss whether or not there should be absolutely a cap put on the number of non-residents. As a California taxpayer, personally, I agree with that, but we'll see what happens. Let's quickly talk about transferring. I'm sorry, question. Is the amount of money per student that the state giving the UC system, going down, staying the same, or going up? So her question was, is the amount of money, money the state is giving UC going down, going up, staying the same? It has dwindled significantly since the 1980s. At one point, the uh, state was giving UC about 30% of its operating budget. Now they're giving us about 9%. So it has dwindled significantly and has dwindled rapidly over the past 10 years. So that's part of the impetus for chancellors wanting their campus to admit more non-resident students because they each pay $23,000 more. So they pay the same $13,000 
plus another 23,000. So in a way, you can see how if a campus decides they're going to enroll 200 more California residents, that additional revenue will help fund those 200 that the state is not funding. Thank you for your question. OK, just quickly, transferring to UC is a very good idea. It allows students to do a couple of things. One, it reduces their total cost of earning a bachelor's degree. Two, it may give them a little bit more time if they're trying to figure out what they really want to study. OK, so we absolutely give priority to transfer students from any one of our state's 112 community colleges. As a matter of fact, over 90% of all of our new transfer applicants come from a California community college. We have <coughs> pathways and we have tools to help guide students through the process. And you can look at all of these websites for detailed guidance for students on how to prepare to transfer. On the next, I'm going to briefly go over what the minimum transfer requirements are. OK, question. No, I'll get to that in a second. His question was, does the transfer admission guarantee apply to all of the campuses? I'll answer it now. Currently, only six of our campuses participate in the TAG program. And when you go to the website, It'll tell you the list of the six campuses. And on another slide, I actually send you to what we call the tag matrix. At UC, we love matrices. I have a matrix for everything. And on that tag matrix, it says, here are the campuses, here are the majors that are a part of the guarantee, here are the minimum requirements to earn that guarantee. And it is subject to change every year. Okay. Okay, minimum requirements, just like with freshmen, this, of course, is not enough in most cases, but it's a pattern of college level courses in these particular subject areas. It's a minimum of 60 UC transferable semester units. We're very explicit about saying UC transferable because some of the courses that are offered at California community colleges, for example, are transferable to CSU, but are not transferable to UC. And we have tools that will guide a student so they'll know if it's transferable to UC or not. The minimum GPA is relatively low in my personal opinion. It's been the same probably since the 60s. Um, at this point, the faculty is not going to change it because meeting that minimum is absolutely not the point that students should be reaching for. Just like with freshman admission, selection is really the thing that they want to try to achieve. So selection is going to be almost entirely dependent upon your major, major preparation. So if a student wants to major in economics, there will be a list that says you need to take macroecon, microecon, stat, calculus, plus general education courses. Your grades in the major prerequisites is going to be the determining factor. So the student might have a C here or there in the GE requirements, but if they have A's and B's in their major requirements, they're going to be very competitive for selection. A student who says, I want to major in um, electrical engineering, who doesn't have calculus, who doesn't have physics, could have a 4.0, they're not going to be selected. So major preparation is really the most important key to transfer admission selection. For some of our campuses, they like to see that students who are coming in at their junior level will have all their freshman, sophomore, general education requirements completed and out of the way. Um, it's case by case, depends on which campus and which program a student is applying to. But the reason for that is, at a California community college, all of their coursework is lower division, freshman, sophomore level courses. And if the student can get not only their major prep, plus that pattern of minimum courses done. And by the way, you can double and triple dip. In other words, one course that might meet one of the, the seven requirements here might also meet a major prerequisite, might also meet a general education requirement. And that's important for people to understand because if you look at it as here's the minimum, here's the major, here's the GE, sounds like a lot of courses, but many cases one course can satisfy more than one requirement. 
But the reason why it's important that students try to get GEs done, it means that they're not going to impact the lower division courses at the campus when they arrive as an upper division junior level student. That's the reason. As I said, competition for selection really varies. Um, and also, we have a very good website called ASSIST. And on the ASSIST website, a student can say, I'm interested in transferring to UC Irvine. I want to major in nursing science. And I go to Las Placitas Community College. It will tell that student exactly what courses they need for major preparation and for general education requirements. All right. At the transfer level, we also employ comprehensive review. It's the same individual consideration. It also looks at context. And there are nine factors, both academic and non, that the uh, campuses look at. And once again, the decision of one campus is not influenced by that of another. Same criteria applies for admission selection. Uh, but because our priority is to California Community College transfers, as I said, over 90%, in some cases at some campuses, 95, 96% of their admission spaces go to students from California community colleges. We also have the same information available, presenting yourself transfer version on our website. And transfer tools that I briefly mentioned, but one that's really important is the transfer admission planner. The minute a student enrolls at a California community college, they can start inputting their courses. The tool will identify that it's a UC transferable course, it will calculate their GPA, and it will count their units. So it's a very good advising tool. It is not designed to replace them actually going and talking to a counselor, but it's a very good tool to use. Um, again, I mentioned the TAG program already and the TAG matrix. Just briefly. Uh, we've talked a little bit about why some of our campuses are admitting non-California residents and those students pay more in tuition and fees than California residents. Tuition and fees right now is $13,300. And the asterisk is there because if the fees vary from one campus to another. So for example, the UC Riverside campus just built a new student recreation center. And those are called student referendum issues. So the student body has to vote, yes, we want the campus to build us a new center because this old one is decrepit and we want new stuff. OK. So what the student fees cover varies from campus to campus. The tuition amount is exactly the same for every UC campus, but the fee amount might be slightly different. And that would make up um, some changes. Overall, the total estimated cost, which is the student budget, which would cover room and board, meals, transportation. My daughter went to UC Riverside, so I knew she was going to fly home back and forth a couple times a year. That also is a part of the student budget. That total cost is $31,100. I didn't pay $31,000 for my daughter when she was at Riverside. There are a lot of ways that you can reduce that sticker price. One, for example, is the selection of the university housing. When my daughter first went to UC Riverside, they had just built a brand new residence hall. And guess what? It costs more than the older residence halls. Why? New construction costs, right? So students are going to pay more because it's a newer facility. Bottom line is they have a room with a desk and a bed. Good enough. Doesn't have to be in the newest building. That's one way to cut your costs. Another way to cut the, your cost is, how many of you went to college buying really big, fat, thick textbooks? And you lugged them around in your backpack? Students don't do that anymore. One, they don't even buy books. Two, they don't have to have them in paper. What now? E-books. You pay online. You look at the book online. You don't even have to buy it. There is lots of competition now for textbook purchases. There are websites that do uh, comparisons for you. Once the student has received their book, required book list from the faculty, they can input the ISBN number. It will show you all the different places that has the books. You find the lowest possible place. You can rent the book for the term, send the hardback book back, or get an e-book subscription. And you can buy the book new. You can buy it used. But there's a lot of ways to reduce the cost. Real life example. 
for an econ course, my daughter's book was $173 at the campus bookstore. We did not buy it from the campus bookstore. We went online and found the same book for $46.75. You can cut that total cost number down a lot. Another way to cut it down is residence hall dining. So young men tend to eat a lot, and they tend to go for their three squares a day, right? Young ladies, they tend to want to eat like birds because they want to keep their petite figure. And so you're paying for a full three meals a day plan, and your daughter is not going there and getting your money's worth. Then don't pay for that meal plan. You can select a meal plan option that is going to fit really the way your child eats. So for example, often students are walking around campus during the noon hour and they might not want to go across campus in the opposite direction to go to the dining commons to eat lunch to walk all the way back, especially if you're in a place like Riverside where it's 105 degrees. So don't pay for more than they're going to use. So there are lots of different ways that you can cut the cost. When I mentioned um, the airfare travel. So if your student is down at UCLA and you don't want them driving back and forth over I-5, rather you're going to throw them on a Southwest Airlines plane and let them just fly in and out, sign up for Ding Alerts. Sometimes they have an eight-hour sale, one-way ticket, LA to the Bay Area, $69. Much better than you waiting until two weeks before they want to come home and that one-way ticket is like $189. I don't understand why there's a different price when the same plane is coming at the same time, but that's what the airlines do. Lots of ways to save money. Important, blue and gold program. The University of California offers blue and gold scholarships for students whose families meet a criteria of less than $80,000 per year. Students do not have to submit a separate application for it. They use the regular financial aid, FAFSA, free application for federal student aid to apply. There is also new, the middle class scholarship program that's offered by the state of California. That allows qualified families with incomes of up to $150,000 a year to have their students receive a scholarship and it's gradated based on the um, amount of money the family makes um, and information on both of those are available on our website as well. Other resources, if you go to our home page, admissions at universityofcalifornia.edu, all of those uh, websites that I mentioned are from that home page. All of the information in my slides is included on the website. And I have about 10 minutes to take questions now. But if I don't get to you, you can write to Ask UC and I answer those questions 24-7, even when I'm sick. All right, thank you very much for your attention. First question. Did you all hear me answer that question already? I'm messing with you, but I already answered that question. UC does not penalize a student for taking it multiple times. We're going to use the one instance of the highest total from the same test date. So she can take it as many times as she wants to. We tell students, don't select score choice. Don't say, I don't want them to know I did it here. Doesn't matter. We're not going to use it to a student's disadvantage. Yes, she can take the application again. Even though our admissions application is due in November, students are allowed to take standardized test date through December of their senior year. And on the application, they can indicate a planned test date in December when they submit in November. So yes, she can take it multiple times. She can tell us all of her scores is not going to hurt her. Or she can choose to only send us certain scores, her choice. But we would recommend she just give us everything. Doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt. Oh, I love that question. Did you guys hear her? Are there any extracurricular activities that are more favorable? Well, 
It's about the student. What do they like doing? What we don't want to see is students who are saying, I'm going to go do this because I think it's going to look good on my resume. If you don't like doing whatever that thing is, you're not learning from it, why do it? It is really important to get a message out to students. Don't try to manufacture an application, right? It's really about what they choose to do and why what they learned as a result of that choice. So no, this activity is not more favorable than that activity. We don't have a scale. We don't have an indefinite list of every activity that could possibly exist on planet Earth. No. I'm sorry, I get really emphatic about that one. Okay, Your third question. Okay, so she wanted to know about some of them. Okay, one of, the, one of the tips we give students is don't try to be too creative. You know, so for a student who's really creative and artsy, I literally, and this, I'm dating myself because now we read everything online. So this is when we actually reviewed on paper. The student wrote the personal statement in a circle. So I had to do this in order to read it. Not a good idea because I'm so distracted from doing this, I can't remember what I'm learning. Um, students, again, that talk about someone other than themselves, a lot of students talk about their grandmother. I would have admitted the grandmother before I took the student. Really, they have to remember it's about themselves. Um, they need to be really reflective, and that is a difficult assignment, particularly for a 16 or 17-year-old. But what we say to students is, First, just jot down some ideas. You know, it's like brainstorming before you write a paper for any of your classes. Just brainstorm. What do you think you want us to know? Then go back through the list. Which is the more important? Because they're limited in the number of space uh, words that they can um, submit. So the personal statement has two individual prompts. One is basically, tell us about the world in which you come from. What influenced you? What are you interested in? The second one is, um, tell us about a talent or skill or event that was really important to you. So we, again, we're asking about, about themselves. Between the two personal statements, the maximum is 1,000 words. We recommend that one of the statements be no less than 250 words. So, but again, as long as the two total, no more than 1,000 is fine. And by the way, we do have a word counter built in our application tool, so they can't go over it. What will happen is it'll get cut off. And again, you asked about my experience reading. Yeah, I get to the end and the sentence dies because the student tried to go over the word count. Now I don't know what the end of that sentence is or if there was more. Don't do it. It's important that they be concise, right? Because when you're reading literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications in about a six week period of time, as an individual reader, I don't need a lot of fluff. No offense to the college board, but I don't need a bunch of SAT words thrown in there, inappropriately used, worse yet. The student just needs to write in an authentic voice. And as an experienced reader, we can tell when it's not the student's voice. Does that mean that they shouldn't get help writing? No, that's not what it means. We encourage students to write it, give it to someone in addition to or even other than their English instructor. Here's why. English instructors, and I apologize if any of you were ever English instructors, tend to focus on structure. That's not our purpose. We're not English instructors as we're reading. Our purpose is to what do we learn about the student. So give it to one of your parents' friends. That's what we tell students. Because they know you, but they might not know a lot of details about you. And so when they get to reading that, they should be able to articulate what I just learned about that person. If they can do that, then you've written a good personal statement. There's no such thing as a per perfect personal statement. There's no such thing as a perfect, perfect application. There's no model application that we want students to go out to and just mimic by changing something here and there. It's really about an individual person and an individual review. All right, no more questions for you. You can have one later. Question. So I think you mentioned this last year, and I just wanted you to reiterate it. As far as students transferring, when they think that they're going to do something great for themselves, they graduate from high school, and they're going to take a couple of classes, 
before they apply. Ah. Yeah, if you would mention that. That's okay, great. so um, one of the, the questions that comes up sometimes is, what is our definition of a freshman versus a transfer student, right? So once a student graduates from high school, with the exception of the summer term immediately following high school graduation, they can still apply as a freshman two years from now, 20 years from now. But once they graduate from high school and they matriculate at a college or university and take a course, they're now a transfer. And UC campuses generally only take junior level transfers. So anybody, I, I saw a couple guys going, what? Is that clear? Because we have that hinky except for the summer immediately following. So if you graduate from high school, want to take some courses in the summer, although most students don't want to do that, right, because they just suffered through four years of high school, but they could take it then. But once they go on, so let's say a student thinks that the right fit for them is a university in Pennsylvania. Okay, I'll change that. Indiana, this is a true story, my nephew, graduated from a high school in Southern California, warm, went to Indiana. By Thanksgiving, I want to transfer, it's too cold out here. Well, you can't come in as a freshman, you have to come in as a junior. So help your students pick that choice. When we talked about the right fit, climate is one of the things they need to consider. Other questions? Yeah. A student is homeschooling, is there a website to make sure that they get the right requirements or meet the right requirements? Yes, I just added that. Um, previously, there was no direct guidance on our website for homeschool students. There is now on the admissions website, when you go to the freshman tab and down the left-hand margin, you'll see homeschool. Basically, the only way a home, well, there's two ways a homeschool student can meet UC requirements. The traditional, my mom is going to teach me and my dad's the principal model is harder because there's no oversight. Nobody knows what they're actually being taught. So in that kind of circumstance where there's no oversight by the high school district in your area, the student can only be eligible by examinations alone. That's a combination of ACT or SAT and SAT subjects. And we give you the detailed information about the requirements by examination alone on our website. A more um, evolved way of doing homeschool is that the student and their family has checked in with their local high school district and they say, here are the reasons why we want to do homeschooling and we're going to use these kind of courses and, you know, are these essentially equivalent in content to what your school offers, okay? A hybrid of that is to use online courses that UC has approved. So if there is an online school that is offering courses, you can look up their UC approved course list on our website. If you find the list, great. If it's not there, it means we haven't approved it. Any other questions? Yeah. GPA, is it true that they look at sophomore and junior year A through G? So she said for the freshman admissions GPA calculation, yes, we look at all A to G courses, not just the minimum number in each subject category, all A to G courses completed beginning with the summer after ninth grade through the summer after the 11th grade. That's the GPA we calculate. That's the GPA we use to make our admissions decision. That has not changed. UC has never included grades earned in the ninth year in the GPA calculation. Here's why. The A to G requirements I was able to research go back to the 1960s. Well, first there was A to F, and then they added another subject category. But the faculty, when they created the way we calculated GPA, the thinking was students transition from middle school, or back in my day it was called junior high school, right, to high school. And you got to make an adjustment. For a lot of kids, it's a bigger school. Um, it's difference of the choices of classes you can take. And so the faculty has always allowed students a transition year in the ninth grade. We still expect all of the A to G courses in the ninth grade to have a letter grade of C or higher. But just in case the student is adjusting to that transition and they get more B's or C's than they might have gotten in the seventh grade or might get in the tenth grade, for example, we don't want to penalize them. 
So it's completing the subject in the ninth year, but we don't use those grades in the calculation. We also don't wait until their senior year. The number of students who say, but Ms. Spears, I promise, I'm going to get straight A's in my senior year. From your mouth to God's ear, I hope so, but we're not going to wait to see whether or not that comes true. But we do expect, as a condition of an offer of admission, that students will maintain the same types of grades in the senior year that they had prior to that. In other words, can't get senioritis and start sliding and grades start dipping because that offer of admission could be rescinded and that's a very bad experience. I used to be the mean lady at the Berkeley campus when I was in admissions and I was the person that the crying students had to come see when they did that. So we don't want them to do that. Sir. I just wanted to be really clear in your fall semester of your senior year, there's nothing you can do in the classes that you take that's going to factor into your GPA calculation or enhance your view on the part of the admission process by taking, you know, advanced courses or anything like that. Okay, so first I'm going to say this. <laughs> in UC, the answer is always, it depends, and yes and no. Okay, so his question was, is there anything a student can do relative to their senior year to affect how their application is reviewed? So part one is the grades we will not wait for and they will not be factored. But more importantly, and you hit it right on the head, is the rigorousness of the senior year load is important. So when a student has been taking five and six solid academic courses across their high school career, what we don't want to see is three in the senior year, unless there's an explanation. Now, a student might say, I picked up an internship. You know, I want to be an architecture, an architect, so I decided to go work at an architectural firm, and from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock every day, I'm over there, so I only have three classes in the morning. There's an explanation. We know what's going on. But in general, you can't go from having five, six solid courses to only having two, three, and four because we're going to want to know why. And within those courses, we're still expecting you to still be at a rigorous level. So if the school offers advanced courses in math, science, language other than in the, uh, English, English composition, history and social sciences, uh, visual and performing arts, we want to see students continue to take that rigorous course load. Thank you for that question. One more. Uh, in the A through G classes, say your Algebra 2 class, uh, one quarter you mess up, get a really bad grade in that class your sophomore year. If you retake it your junior year, does it re and get a good grade? Does it replace that grade or does that just add in as part of the average? Okay, so the question has to do with repeating A to G courses, right? If the course was taken in grade 9 or 10, and repeated in grade 10 or 11, and the first instance was a grade of D or F, and the second instance, or even the third instance, if it took them another a time to do it, is a C or better, we replace the D or F and use the first instance of a C or better. We do not average the grades, we replace them. If they repeat the course, that is essentially the same in content. So for example, if one school calls it um, Algebra 3-4 and another school calls it Algebra 2, well, try to program a computer to recognize that those are the same thing, right? So we don't say exact same course title, we say the same course content, in which case it would consider that as a repeat. Uh, this lady had a question here. Um, I have a slightly unusual case. My son is taking concurrent enrollment classes at Las Positas. Okay. And, um, That's not unusual. That happens a lot. Okay. Well, he's, he took two semesters of college English, and his guidance counselor at his school believes that that counts as two years. One semester of college counts as one year of high school. I love his guidance counselor. She's right. Okay. On our website, we have... A uh, booklet is actually designed for high school counselors and community college counselors it's called Quick Reference for Counselors. And in the Quick Reference booklet, we have a matrix, as I love matrices, it's called Options for Satisfying A to G Subject Requirements. And it clearly explains that a one-term college or university level course of 
a minimum three semester units or four quarter units is equivalent to one year of high school instruction. So the counselor is right. Uh, question behind. Um, can you talk about um, what might be the advantages or disadvantages of a student wanting to take off a year between graduation and going to college? Okay, so the question is, are there advantages or disadvantages to what we will refer to as a gap year, right? So with the limitation that the student cannot enroll at a collegiate institution because that changes their status from a freshman to a transfer, there's no advantage or disadvantage. Student just decides that they want to wait a term to apply. What generally does not happen is that a student would apply for fall of 15 and actually want to take off the year and come back in fall of 16 and they ask the UC campus to defer their admission for a year. Most campuses will not defer the admission. So in most cases, the students should wait until they actually want to matriculate and apply for that term. And there's no disadvantage or advantage one way or the other. All right, I don't see any more hands up and I'm sorry, it's a little after one. So I thank you for your time and attention. And again, you can email me or walk out with me and I'll continue to answer questions. Thank you.